It happened in my bedroom. At the age of 10, I always had trouble sleeping, and I spent most nights tossing and turning. I was a horror film fanatic as a child, and being scared was something I didn't have much experience with. I was not afraid of the dark, nor was I easily swayed by strange sounds or odd encounters. I did, however, know when to haul ass out of a situation or to find a trusted adult. I always slept with my closet doors open, which will come to be of some significance later in the story. I should also mention that my family home was in a heavily wooded area in what some may refer to as the middle of nowhere. One night, around 1am, I awoke to a sound coming from underneath my bed. It sounded like one of my cats was scratching themselves with one of their feet or doing something to cause a thumping beneath me. I had heard this same sound many times before, and its source had always been one of my fuzzy friends. So this time, I didn't look. I closed my eyes and tried to resume my slumber. I turned over onto my left side, which left me facing the wall against which my bed was pressed up, and I heard the same sound again, and thinking that my kitty was directly beneath me, I said, Good night. I was able to fall asleep once again. The next time I awoke, it was to a surreal and shocking scene. The sheet and comforter of my bed were no longer covering me. I saw a man standing over my bed, poking me. Yeah, poking me with his finger, and the way in which he did so was truly horrifying. It was not the way that a child would poke a friend in jest. It was as if he was touching another human being for the very first time exploring the sensation of the tip of his index finger jabbing at flesh. What I saw was so unbelievable, so impossibly strange, that I believed I was dreaming. I tried desperately to awake from my nightmare to no avail, and the poking continued. He poked at my chest, my belly, my legs, and arms. Paralyzed and scared as shitless, I yelled, Wake up! And with this, the man threw himself to the floor and closed his eyes, as if he was trying to lead me to believe that he was asleep, or even dead. I have no idea. It was at this time I realized I could not have been dreaming. I somehow found the ability to move, and I jumped from the top of my bed over the man lying on the floor next to me and ran towards my parents' room. When I got to their bedroom door, something then came over me. I told myself that this was all impossible, that there was no way that a person could have entered our home without breaking in, as we had always kept every door and window locked at night. I had seen many strange things in my home whilst either falling asleep or waking up, but by the third or fourth time, after speaking to my mom or dad about it, I knew that it was my mind playing tricks on me. Plush toys do not have the ability to turn and whisper into each other's ears. Do not ask why, dear reader, as I have no explanation to offer you, but I turned away from my parents' bedroom door and decided to hastily check the house for a break-in. What I found was that nothing was out of the ordinary. No broken windows or broken locks. No busted doors. Nothing. I assured myself that I had to have been dreaming or hallucinating, and I blamed my obsession with horror for this. I made my way down the long, dark and narrow hallway to my bedroom. I peeked inside, and I saw no one. I then turned on the light, got down on the floor just outside the doorway, and I looked under the bed. Nothing. I then proceeded to check both of my windows for signs of a break-in, which were not present. Both windows were closed and locked. I knew it. I was totally seeing things. So I crawled back into bed and decided to watch some TV in order to calm myself down and distract from thoughts of the scary as hell dream slash hallucination I just had. I turned on the TV. I flipped to a channel with a seemingly boring program. This always helped me become sleepy and put the remote control on my bedside table. I was lying on my right side, facing away from the wall that I mentioned previously. 
As I laid there, my eyes began to adjust to the dark room with the faint light from the TV screen. Just beyond the TV, I saw something that made my heart sink into the pit of my stomach. Inside my closet, with one of the doors now slightly closed, I saw the man standing perfectly still, facing the wall. He's hiding, waiting for me to fall asleep. That's at least what I imagine. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move. I sat and stared at the man in my closet for what seemed like minutes, but was likely only a few seconds. I then quietly got out of bed, hoping that the man wouldn't notice and that my dad could catch him hiding in the closet. I once again made my way to my parents' bedroom door, still remaining as quiet as I possibly could, and I went inside. I then shook my dad and mom at the same time, and when they awoke, I said, Shh, don't make any sound. There's someone in my closet. My parents both jumped up and said, What? I repeated myself and asked them to please call 911. My mom immediately picked up the phone. Neither of my parents doubted my claim, as I'd always been honest and forthright. They both knew there was no way that I was making this up, or that I was mistaken by the situation. I'm sure that the look I must have had on my face made it very clear that this was really happening. My dad told my mom and I that he was going to look, and urged us to stay in their bedroom and lock the door. That's exactly what we did. At this point, I was beyond scared. I didn't know what the man was capable of, whether he had a weapon, or whether my dad was safe. I just stood in the room with my mom and cried. After what felt like hours, my dad knocked on the door and told me it was him, and that it was okay to open the door. My mom unlocked the door and let my dad inside. I said something to the effect of, Did you get him? And my dad looked at me, with the most unsettling and confused look imaginable. He said, There's no one there. I assured him that there was indeed a man in my room, and that he had been poking me as well. My dad said that he had just checked every inch of the house, and he found no one. He also checked the doors and windows, just as I had done. Then it hit me. He must have had a key. As soon as I said this, my parents looked at each other in absolute terror. Our nearest neighbor, a trusted and beloved friend, whom we considered family, was in possession of a key to our house, as she had regularly babysat me since I was a toddler. She was the only person outside my immediate family with a key to our home. Soon after this revelation, the police arrived. They took statements, and they checked around our property and left. None of us got any sleep that night. The next day, my dad went to my neighbor's house and asked if she knew where her key to our house was. She said yes, and when she went to show him, she saw that it was missing. Her home had no signs of a break-in, and she had always kept her doors and windows locked as well. My parents had all the locks on our doors changed after this, and opted to never again give a key to anyone, except in the wake of an emergency. I never discovered the identity of the man that lurked in my bedroom that night. Needless to say, the event left me traumatized, and it took a very long time for me to accept what had happened, and I could finally move on. My sleeping trouble turned into full-on insomnia, and for about a decade, I was unable to sleep without a light on. It has now been 20 years since that night, and apart from my parents, I have never told a soul about it until now. I've actually found writing this to be very cathartic, and I'm glad that I stumbled across Let's Not Meet. My heart goes out to anyone who has suffered a trauma in their lives, and I hope that you're all able to find peace within yourselves. When I was about 13 years old, I had not long broken up with this girl who supposedly had a psycho family. One of this girl's family was a close friend who was supposedly obsessed with her. I was invited out with my friends after school one day, and this boy latched on. Everybody told me to come out and that he wanted to make amends, 
and he understood why I did what I did, etc. Being the pushover I am, I went out, and we hung out in the parks, and smoked, and drank. As it started to get dark, I decided to go home. I felt uneasy being around him, and he started acting all weird, talking about fights he had been in. He was also bragging about bashing some guy's face in with his fist in school. Because of this, I left. I didn't feel safe whatsoever. The next day, my best friend and all the other kids that were out that night came into school and told me that it got worse after I left. Apparently, after they had drank some more, he started waving this huge kitchen knife around and was telling everybody how he was going to stab me in the stomach for breaking that girl's heart. Now let me point out I only know details of this because I have a relative in the local police force. My dad made us move because he knew where I lived. I continued getting death threats on social media though. That was until about a year or two later when it was in the paper and was spread around the town that he had broke into somebody's house and stabbed a man to death, and then slit his wrists in the man's bathtub. They found high amounts of cocaine and cannabis in his system, along with a lot of alcohol. The elderly neighbors phoned the police when they heard some commotion, and they hadn't seen the man leave for work. They found him barely conscious, and he is now in a psych ward. Again, this was supposedly over a girl. Needless to say, I'm pretty sure that I dodged a bullet there. I work in a rural mental health center in my hometown. This happened about a year after I first started working there. I was also going to college full time and only going to work part time. I worked at the front desk at the time and there was one particular client who took a liking to me. This guy had done a lot of meth in his day, and it basically fried his brain. He has drug-induced schizophrenia, and is also really into conspiracy theories. At some point, we spoke while he was checking in, and he found out my mom's last name through that conversation. We have a different last name due to my parents' divorce. But for the life of me, I can't remember ever giving that kind of personal information to a client. But it could have been that he just knew who my family was, since this is a small town, and basically everyone knows everyone. Plus, my family owns a pretty big business in our town, but he remembers me telling him, so really, who knows? About a month or two after that, he started calling two or three times a day for me. Keep in mind, I'm not a clinician. I don't have any one client I talk to. So, it's weird for a client to ask for me, but he would only call when I was in class or on PTO days. One day, his clinician pulled me aside and told me that he was concerned for my safety because of this client. The client had come in for an appointment and told his therapist that he had a premonition about me. Something bad had happened to me and he was going to be the one who saved me. Apparently, one night while he was watching his regular unsolved crime shows, he ran across a story about Leia Rochelle Pebbles, who just so happens to have gone missing in the same state I live in, and shares my last name, and her middle name is similar to my first name. On top of that, my co-worker's name was AJ, and Leia had a pimp named AJ. He had got it in his head that... I was Leia, and I had been kidnapped by my family and my co-worker, and they had brainwashed me into thinking that I was who I am now, and as a result, I lost all my memory of my previous life. He was determined to save me and return me to my correct family. After that, I started noticing his car around pretty much everywhere I went. He stalked my Facebook and messaged all the family members I had listed and my top friends. Luckily, I told all these people about this guy and to not engage him whatsoever. When he didn't get a reply, he wouldn't push it, except with my mom. 
who also works in the facility I work in, just in IT. He would message her daily asking about me, asking why she took me, and if she felt bad. I had to be walked in and out of work for about six months after, and I couldn't go anywhere in public alone. I don't go out that much, so that wasn't really much of an issue. I think he dropped it eventually. I'm still not allowed to be out front when he's coming in, and occasionally I still see his car drive by my house every once in a while, which is even creepier because I've moved twice since then. So, creepy client, let's not meet again. I know that this may sound far-fetched, but hand on heart, this is a true story. I can totally understand if you don't believe me, as it sounds very unbelievable. However, I know what happened to me, and I for one just want people to know. Firstly, just some background information. I live in a relatively small town in the country. When I was younger, around 13 to 14, I used to be obsessed with anything secret related. I would spend hours looking up conspiracy theories, watching documentaries about foreign affairs, reading articles about secret wars. I would tell everything I learned to my friends and family, but all I would really get is a, that's nice, or I doubted that ever happened from them. No one really seemed to be interested, except for one friend of mine named Craig. We would hang out every now and then, and all we would talk about is conspiracies. Occasionally, we would have a sleepover, and instead of playing video games or watching movies, we would get out our laptops and do as much research as we could. We would write down websites we deemed creepy, and writing in notebooks filled with information that we had gathered. It was quite the exciting bit for both of us. We felt like we knew things that we weren't meant to know, and that gave us a rush. So one night, Craig was over at my house for a sleepover, and we were doing our usual secret work, and I came across this website deep within Google, on something like page 79 in the search engine. It had a list of Russian statesmen slash politicians from a former branch of the Russian space program. I knew that because I recognized the intercosmos symbol on the top left hand corner of the page. The page was all in Russian and I just randomly started clicking around. I eventually got to a page that looked like contact information. It had what looked like an email address at the bottom. So dumb, naive me thought it would be a great idea to send them an email using my own personal email address. At the time, my email was just my full name. I wrote an email consisting of something along the lines of, Hello, my name is The Flair, and I was just wondering if you would be willing to answer some questions. It's about the space program. I then proceeded to list conspiracy theories about the Russian space program and demanding an answer from them. Me and Craig thought this was very clever as we were hoping to at least get a response. In our heads, if they denied what we had asked them, then they were just covering up the evidence, and therefore we had the real proof. To our surprise, the email actually sent. We thought it would have been unable to send due to how old we thought the email address was. Weeks end up passing, and we eventually forget about the email. We just got along with our daily lives of going to school and doing dumb, young, teenage stuff. One weekend I was sitting at the dinner table with my family and my sister started asking if my father had any Russian friends. My father said no, but he had worked in Russia for a few years in the past. My sister goes on to say that her friend's mother was stopped in the street while walking home from work by two men with Russian accents in a dark green car. They asked if she knew where they could find my house. They even said my family's last name. My dad said that that was weird and he would call my sister's friend's mom later. I immediately thought back to that email I had sent. My young head started spinning with ideas of spies trying to get to me 
and my family. I thought it was rather exciting. After dinner, my father called my sister's friend's mom, and I listened in from upstairs. I couldn't really hear much out of my father's end of the conversation, but as soon as my father hung up, he called the family down to have a talk. He told us that what my sister said was true, and he was worried that it may be some thieves trying to scope the house out. He told us to keep a lookout for a big dark green car with dark windows. If we saw something suspicious, we were to immediately find him and tell him. It was at this point I thought about telling my dad about the email, but I thought I would get in trouble, so I decided against it. The next day, I was asked by my mother to take the trash out to the front to be collected tomorrow. We lived at the bottom of a long path in the countryside, so it takes about five minutes to walk up to the top of the driveway. As I was near the top of the path, I noticed a car parked up just off to the side of our driveway entrance, about 50 feet away. When I got closer, I realized it was the same car my father had described to me, a dark green car with blacked out windows just sitting there. I pretended not to notice it and just dumped the trash. I turned around and got on my phone and called my dad's mobile. He picked up and I told him that the car he had described was at the top of the driveway. He told me to come back to the house, and he would be straight out. I slowly started to walk back home, keeping the car in my peripheral vision. Not a minute later, my dad was jogging up the driveway and asked me where the car was. I turned around and pointed at it. He began to run up the driveway towards the car. Suddenly, the car's engines turned on and it peeled away at speed down the road. Stunned by what just happened, me and my dad just looked at each other. We both ran back home. He told me to promise not to tell my mother or sister as it might scare them. When we got back home, he took me into his home office. Then he called the police. The police said there's not much they could do as they hadn't done anything illegal, but to call back if they kept showing up. Well, they did show up again. Every time it was me or my dad that would notice them, and the same route would happen. One of us would see the car, try to get close or flag it down. It would then speed off, call the police, then repeat. My mother even saw it once when coming home from shopping. The police eventually sent a car to patrol our area, but they never saw the dark green car. My dad was getting noticeably paranoid and even considered buying a rifle. This whole time, I genuinely thought it was my fault, and if I'd never sent that email, then none of this would happen. But I just didn't want to get in trouble. Once I got actually quite close to the car, as it stalled while trying to drive off, I tried to read the license plate, but the car was side on to me. By the time I got any closer, it was too far down the road. At that point, I wasn't scared anymore, just angry, and I wanted the people in that car just to leave us alone. The worst part for me happened when I was home alone. Both my mother and father were at work, and my sister was at one of her after-school programs. My dad told me to keep the door locked at all times, and if anything were to happen, to call the police. I was watching TV in the living room when I heard the gravel in our driveway move. This was the distinctive sound of a car coming down the driveway. I got up to see which one of my parents were home from work, but it wasn't either of them. The dark green car was now in the driveway. I felt so helpless and scared. It just stayed parked there, engine still running. I jumped up to grab the home phone, but as soon as I got up, the car turned around and drove away. I immediately called my dad. He told me that he was going to be home soon and just to keep the door locked. When he got home, I told him about what happened. He didn't see the car when driving back, but again he called the police. This continued on for at least two weeks. Every day we felt more and more like we were being watched, even hunted. We would see the car at all hours of the day, even noticing them around midnight, just sitting there at the top of our drive. However, 
One day they didn't turn up, and then finally the car just stopped showing up altogether. We never saw it again, or the people who drove it, but it left the family scared for a good few months. After this experience, I stopped my research. Me and Craig drifted apart, and I got into what I deemed safer hobbies. I cannot be sure what started these events, and I don't know if this had anything to do with my email. It may have just been a coincidence in timing. It did however feel sinister in nature, and that fear has stuck. It is this fear of knowing you are being watched and not feeling safe in your own home. It's lasted with me for some time. As I stated before, I know this sounds untrue, but I swear it is true, and I cannot express that enough. Anyway, thank you for taking the time to read this, and if anyone has had any experiences similar to mine, then please let me know. I suppose I should end my story like this then. Whoever you were in that dark green car, stay away from me and my family, and let's never meet again. I've never told this story to anyone other than my closest friends, but this felt like a good outlet to finally get it out. There's something called the Six Degrees of Separation Theory, which basically states that everyone in the world is separated by at most six steps. Well, I am separated from Trent Reznor, Nine Inch Nails Mastermind, by just one step, and it was due to a stalker. Back in 2006, I was living in Atlanta, Georgia. I had just joined a pretty particular punk band, which mixed a very loud sound with Carberry visuals. We never made it big, but our act was appealing enough that it got us the attention of many people. One of them was a strange girl, who was always chain-smoking, had a weird aura to herself, and who was always wearing a jacket on her shoulders, meaning her arms were not in the sleeves, and who eventually said she wanted to be our manager. She said that she was friends with Slash from Guns N' Roses, that she had managed a couple of bands when she used to live in New Orleans and whatnot, so we decided to hear her out. Our band was sort of a crazy one, so drugs passed around freely in our parties. This girl, she told us her name was Christy something, would provide us with party favors sometimes. She told us that she was worth two million dollars, that she had five cars, that she worked in this luxury building that had a huge house somewhere in the suburbs. The thing is, she was always picking cigarette butts from the street and smoking the filters like she was a homeless person. Something about her just didn't click particularly well with me. She always came to see us in a sort of fancy SUV, so we went along with her stories for the most part. Eventually, Christy fell hard for me. She told me she was divorcing her husband and that she wanted to be with me. I was intrigued by her and so I started testing all her stories. I asked to visit her at her office, and she would always make excuses as to why I couldn't, until eventually she told me her office had closed down, and that they were looking for a new space. I asked her why she was using the same car if she had like five, and again, excuses, and more excuses. I asked to visit her at her huge house, and it was the same thing. She would come up with off reasons as to why she couldn't have me visit, mostly that her husband was still there and whatnot. I started to get sick of all of her excuses, and eventually, I confronted her that I thought she was a big fat liar. She got desperate. She started to make more excuses, and I just told her to get lost. She had a previous fight with some of my bandmates before, so... She had already been discarded as our prospective manager. She started calling me every day, asking to see me. I would constantly tell her no, until one day she showed up at my house around 5am, apparently wasted. She said she had picked up this guy friend of hers to go party, but that he was too drunk, and that he was now passed out in her car, and she didn't know what to do with him. 
I looked across the street and saw no one in her vehicle, and she said it was because this guy was laying down. I didn't really feel like bothering going to her car to check it out. She eventually started crying, and I felt bad enough for her that I let her come into my living room. It was at this point that she took off her jacket, and, for the first time ever, I realized that she was missing her entire left arm. I was already giddy by her showing up at my house drunk and all, that I didn't dare asking how that happened. I know this has nothing to do with my story, but it was something that just added to the already weirded out atmosphere. I hung out with her for a while. At this point I started doubting that she was actually drunk, and I gave her coffee, and I told her to please never show up at my house like that again, and eventually told her to just drop the guy at a waffle house and then just go home. It might not have been the most reasonable and responsible thing to tell someone in that state to drive, but I just wanted the whole thing to be over, and, like I said, I felt that she was acting drunk the whole time, and she seemed okay enough to drive. She eventually left, and that was that for that night. Next day, again, she started stalking me by phone, to the point I just stopped picking up. I worked early hours, and she would call me at 2 or 3 a.m., completely drunk. I eventually got sick of it all, and told her to stay away from me, and to never call me again. She complied, and, for about a week, it seemed like the whole thing was history. Around six days later, she calls me again when I was at work. I started telling her that she wasn't supposed to be calling me, but she said that she could finally invite me to her house, and that she wanted me to come visit her. All sorts of red flags went up for me, so of course I told her to forget about it, and just hung up on her. She again started calling me at late hours, to the point that I just had to turn off my phone at night, otherwise I would never get a good night's sleep. I remember it was a Friday. After waking up, I had a voicemail on my phone, left at around 2 in the morning. I checked it out, and it was her, saying, Hi Max, I just took 200 pills, and I've been drinking all night. I just wanted to say goodbye, and that I love you. Good luck with the rest of your life. Needless to say, I got totally weirded out. I was so sick of her lies, so I just deleted the message, completely assuming it was one of her plays to get me to call her, and I decided to forget about it, and I went to work. Next Tuesday, after that, I get another voicemail from her phone, but this time it was a guy's voice. Hi Max, this is Christy's husband. I'm calling her friends in her contact list to let them know that she passed away last Friday and we're doing a memorial for her in downtown Atlanta tomorrow. If you want to go, please call me back so I can give you the address. I can't even explain how I felt at that point. I was shocked and I tried to evade the news by thinking that this was some guy that Christy had manipulated into calling me just to get me somewhere at some time. But of course, the whole situation didn't make much sense to me. This guy eventually called another of my bandmates, whose name was in Christie's contact list as well. I had told my band about the entire situation. So, my bandmate, who had been suspicious of this girl for a while, started prying this guy for more information. We eventually learned that she used a fake name with us the whole time. Her real name was Amber Applebaum and that she was using a made-up name because she had been in trouble with the law before. We googled her, and sure enough, it turns out she had stalked Trent Reznor in the past and even managed to steal his credit card information. She even was arrested for it. I was stunned at this point, unsure of what to do next. We never went to the memorial, since we were way too suspicious to do it. To this day, I... Still don't know if this girl killed herself for real, or if the whole thing was just a sham to get me into some trouble. But since I've never heard from her again, I doubt it. It's that. Or maybe she's been using a fake name ever since, and decided to move on with her life. I'll never know, 
but it's definitely the worst way to get one degree of separation with someone famous. I got rid of my cell phone after that, and it took me three years until I finally felt okay enough to get a new one. I really never want to go through something like this ever again. I love this subreddit, and I never thought I'd be posting a story on here. My city has been voted one of the safest cities in the world. This is going to be a long story, by the way. My fiancé and two friends dropped acid for the first time. I was completely sober, but they all wanted to go for a walk. It's 1am, but I was having fun watching them trip, so I was down, and I suggest we bring our one dog since it was nighttime. My dog is a scary big breed. We have a bike path that is surrounded by trees and bushes, so we decided to walk down that and we're just going to go to a big hill and chill. We noticed there was a house party going on in one of the backyards. Two of my buddies wanted to go join the party, but we convinced them to stay. So we're just sitting on the hill, joking around, and we heard this weird cooing noise. We all were just laughing about it, thinking it was some high school kids, and we continued having fun. The cooing continued for five minutes, and we were starting to get weirded out, and then we realized that they were up in the trees. At this point, my fiancé and one friend were at the bottom of the hill. They start walking up, and me and my other friend notice a guy jump down from one of the trees. Then two guys jumped down. Then we notice the guys coming out of bushes besides us, and coming up the hill, starting to surround us. My friend who was with me grew some crazy balls, and starts walking towards them, being like, what the hell are you going to do? Back up. My fiancé and second friend also start walking towards them, and some huge guy who does not look like he's from this area at all, just steps out and steps to them like he's going to fight. My dog starts going ape shit. This is a dog who is a complete sucky love bug who submissive pees when someone comes over. His hackles are up, and he has the deepest, biggest bark I've ever heard come out of his mouth. We just see a bunch of dudes back right up, except the huge guy. My friend is still trying to be tough at this point, and he's saying to back up, or we're going to let the dog go. The huge guy says, What the hell is your dog going to do? and steps toward them again. At this point, my fiancé is like, okay, this dude is screwed up, and this is a bad situation. If anyone swung, all the guys surrounding us would have jumped in. My fiancé is telling my two friends that we all need to go now, and trying to get them up the hill. I think everyone all of a sudden lost their high, and we just walked away. That situation could have been so screwed up. They were in the trees before we got there, otherwise we would have seen and heard them. So it's like it was planned, and they were waiting for some kids to just come up the hill, drunk, and then jump them. If we didn't have the dog with us, 100% we would have been jumped. It's just because all the big guy's friends backed up when they saw and heard the dog. I mean, who the hell sits in trees and then coos at people? and surrounds them without having bad intentions. It's really scary. I think if my friend didn't try and act tough the minute we turned to walk away, they would have snuck up behind us and jumped us. It seemed very planned. Hands down, the creepiest, most messed up thing I've ever experienced. I went to a boarding school in a pretty impoverished part of town. There were a lot of muggings and a lot of drugs, primarily crack, in the surrounding areas. You were not allowed to leave campus by yourself, by the way. Back in 2011, my girlfriend and I had just started dating, and one day we decided that we were hungry and wanted to go get some fast food somewhere. There were five different fast food restaurants in the immediate vicinity of the campus, as we are walking down the main street, she and I notice someone walking on the other side of the busy street, who appears to be drugged out of his mind. He was walking in the most 
peculiar way, almost like he was galloping, shuffling, and limping at the same time. However, what stood out about him the most was that he was wearing these bright blue-green pants, almost like a pair of scrubs. I suppose that she and I had been staring, because he now comes to a stop and stares right back at us. This didn't bother us, but what he did next really unnerved us. Without taking his eyes off of us, he gallop, shuffle, limps his way across the busy street, which actually becomes a highway a few blocks down, without even checking for oncoming cars. At this point, we're kind of concerned, but we assume that he's very high or mentally infirm, or possibly both, and we continue on our walk. As our walk continues, I begin to hear this vague, undecipherable muttering growing steadily louder. I turn around, and there he is. This man that my girlfriend and I would later dub Crazy Pants McGee, very close to us, with something that appears to be a syringe in his hands. Anyway, I grab my girlfriend, and we walk briskly across the street, and we continue walking at a hurried pace down the road. By now I think we're safely away from this guy, until I hear the muttering behind me again. This crazy man has followed us across the street, again, and this time, I can definitely make out the definitive shape of a syringe in his hand, holding it in a fashion like someone would hold a knife to stab another with. My girlfriend and I are freaking the hell out, and practically sprint across the street one more time, and I mentally preparing myself to throw myself between my girlfriend and crazy pants, whatever that was going to entail. For the third time, he shuffles and gallops his way across the street at a fevered pace to catch up to us, muttering louder and louder as he picks up his pace. At this point, girlfriend and I are sprinting down the street, trying to find some place to hide, and a crazy pants is gaining on us. We finally see a CVS we could use to escape to, and we run into it and hide in one of the aisles. We now watch crazy pants stumble into this door and begin looking for us. When I decide that there's no way he can see us from where he is, she and I make a break for it, and then we run as fast as either of us have ever run, all the way back to campus. This started in April of this year, and is somewhat still going on. My husband and I bought a cabin on seven acres of land. It's part woods, but the majority is open fields, that's partially fenced. There is a tree line that separates one side of my land from a neighboring farm. That tree line is a nice view out my kitchen window, and it's actually quite pretty, but it now terrifies me. Around the end of April, I'm walking my land, just exploring as we had just moved in. I happen to glance up, and I see an unoccupied tree stand. I didn't think much of it, since we live in the country and the land is full of deer and turkey. It was not hunting season, but people still like to watch the wildlife. The only off thing about it was that it faced my house. Anyway, I went on with my day not thinking about it. About two days later, I'm pulling in my driveway, and I happen to look across my field, and I see the damn tree stand in a freaking different tree, and it's still facing my house. It creeped me out, but... I didn't feel threatened because there's one and a half acres between my house and the tree stand. I had never seen a person in the stand and my husband told me it's most likely someone deer or bird watching, which did make me feel better. The tree stand ended up moving from tree to tree so much that it became a game between my daughter and I to play find the tree stand. That is until late June. It was almost dark outside when I took our puppy out to potty. As he is doing his business, I mosey on over toward the tree line, not even thinking about the tree stand. I tend to wander around our property, just enjoying the peacefulness and animal noises. Now, I'm not really good with determining distance, but I guess I was about 25 feet from the tree line when I see him. 
a man with what looked like either a camera or binoculars around his neck. I couldn't make out many details because it was almost dark. I truly don't believe he knew that I saw him because I didn't react to him. I was walking diagonally toward the tree line and I could see him out of my right peripheral vision. I pretended like I don't see him and mosey my way back forward toward my house. When I hear a crack of the tree stand and him scurrying down the damn tree, he had to make it down the stand, which gave me a head start. However, he was frantically making his way out of the tree. I looked back one time and I saw him at the edge of a cattle fence looking at me. My husband searched the property line for him, but didn't locate him. My daughter no longer stays home alone and I carry my pistol every time I go outside. I hate having to carry a weapon on my own property. I feel as though I'm being watched and it's not a good feeling. We still see the tree stand and it has moved from tree to tree. Sometimes we can't spot it at all, which creeps me out even more. Edit. I probably should have originally posted that the tree stand has not been on my side of the property. It has always been on the tree line, and the neighbor owns said tree line. They planted trees and let the brush grow up as a way to divide the land. There is also a cattle fence along the tree line. This was in the summer of 1999 when I was 8 years old. I'm female by the way. My uncle had come to visit us from Juneau, Alaska since he had time away from work. Since he's always been the planner of sorts and the really rich uncle who gets all of us nice things, he convinced my parents as well as my other aunt Susan and her two sons, them being my cousins Jack and Thomas, aged 9 and 7 respectively to take a one-week vacation adventure to Las Vegas and to the Grand Canyon. For context, we were driving from Laguna Beach, California. Now, we would be staying at Circus Circus, and while all of that was fun and all, the point to me riding to the Creepy Fox is to share what happened while on the way to the Grand Canyon. To this day, it cements the reality of the world around us. You see, it is sad how there are creeps out there that lurk on the innocence of others, especially when it comes to children. Oh, but let there be an adult around, and they act like cowards and scatter like cockroaches, absolute scum of the earth. Yeah, you can probably already tell I don't much like creeps. Anyway, we were still a couple of hours away from the Grand Canyon after spending four days in Vegas playing games and swimming in the pool. And for a late lunch, we decided on stopping in a rest area of sorts with a gas station in it. There was also a McDonald's with a play place and a subway which was attached to said gas station. Naturally, us three kids wanted to go to the McDonald's as it would be a nice break from sitting in the car for so many hours. All the adults agreed. Thus, we made the decision to stay. We all ordered the same kids meal. And after we had our fill of salt and sugar... We go into the play place where we're happy to see it's pretty much a ghost town in there. It was exciting considering you rarely get an opportunity to play in the play place, especially without getting interrupted by other kids. Anyway, while I was climbing on top of the jungle gym area, my other two cousins playing with the Nintendo 64s that are there, there were only two. I happened to look out the huge glass window. This was an indoor play place with air conditioning. And I noticed a middle-aged, shaggy-looking man just staring over at my cousins in a strange fashion. I don't mean just a casual glance. I'm talking about he's pressed up against the glass windows, with his hands clasped out to his face. Also, this is the summertime, but he's full-on got a hefty sweater and jeans on, unless he was trying to lose weight for some reason. I don't really remember him being a fairly large individual. But then it was strange seeing him dressed in a fashion that could have given him heat exhaustion, if not worse. But I digress. I eventually went down the slide, and when I exit the tunnel of said slide, the guy was gone. Well, whatever, I say to myself. Must just be my over-imagination. I walk over to my cousins and I ask them if they had seen the guy looking at them, but they said no which figured as such since they're boys and they're focused on the video games. 
If I remember correctly, the McDonald's had Mario Kart 64 set up. Well, by now, I'm starting to feel my bladder screaming at me to go and use the restroom. Thus, I told my cousins I would be right back, and they just nod their heads. I go inside the McDonald's, and at this point some more customers had arrived, making the place a bit more lively. No signs of that creepy guy. I make it over to the restroom, where I bumped into my uncle who says he's going to walk over to the gas station to fill up the car. That way we didn't have to worry about it after we were all done eating. I said sweet, and I walk in to do my business. Now what happens next was so quick, so fast, that it's one of those blink and you'll miss it kind of deals. I'd finished my business, and as soon as I opened the restroom door, the male side restroom opens as well. It was that shaggy guy from outside a few minutes ago. I gave him a quick smile and a nod, even though something about him earlier did give me the heebie-jeebies. And when I turned to go down the small walkway that connects this back area to the rest of the McDonald's, he jumps in front of me and then blocks my way. Why he did that, I was confused. But when I suddenly see as he grabs and picks me up, putting me over his shoulder, like the killer does in Dead by Daylight, if you've ever played that game you'll know what I'm referring to, I now knew this was trouble. I was being kidnapped. This creep was taking advantage of the fact nobody was back here. By the way, even though this is all happening in real time, it felt like slow motion to me. All I remember next happening was me trying to wiggle my way off as I start screaming at the top of my lungs, but I'm not able to hear any sort of noise. I remember seeing my mom at the very back of the McDonald's as she has the view of the door and she suddenly perked up and her mouth opens to scream. But again, for some reason I can't hear anything at all. The doors to the McDonald's opens as a huge blast of warm air presses against my cheeks and my eyes squint to the brightness of the outdoors and the sunlight above. Almost as soon as this had all begun, I begin falling to the ground. Again, at least it seems like to me, it's happening in slow motion. But why was I falling? I would find out in just a mere seconds when all my senses returned and I see and hear my uncle just a few feet away. The creep had let me go, and he tries to take off running, screaming and shouting and heading to a nearby parked van with all its windows tinted. He yelled at the driver to wait up, but the van drove off without him. I now saw as my uncle took a heavy swing at the back of this creep's head, which sees him almost instantly fall down to the hot pavement below. My uncle now gets on top of him and then puts him into an armbar hold and yells over to me asking to go inside and to get help. I did as I finally realized the reality of the situation. My dad and two other large men stormed out of the front doors before I get the chance to go in there. They helped with subduing this creep. My mom and aunt now came to get me and we go inside the McDonald's where one of the employees is now calling 911. Cops arrived in about 15 minutes. The whole time, my uncle, my dad, and the other two men are not letting the man go. And long story short, the cops handcuffed the creep and take him away. I did get questioned by one of the nice officers, and she told me that I was safe and the creep was no longer a threat. Though, fast forward about a week later, I would have recurring nightmares. Anyway, speaking of fast forwarding, I'm now a mom and I have two kids myself. I've told them this story on several occasions and they get the chills anytime they hear it. I mean it really is crazy when you think about it. One minute you're on vacation with your family and you're enjoying your nice summer break. The next thing you know, a random guy grabs you and attempts to kidnap you to do who knows what. I am thankful for my uncle being there at the right place at the right time. I still believe had things not been timed the way they were, where my uncle was now walking back to the McDonald's, things could have ended worse. Not that I think my parents would have been able to catch up to me, but considering this creep was working with an accomplice in a nearby vehicle, they might have gotten me into that van, and we probably would have driven off into the desert, where I might have never been heard from ever again. So my warning to all of you out there, please. Try your best to stay safe, and parents out there, look after your kids 
and don't keep your eyes off of them no matter what. About a year ago, this man started coming to the grocery store that I work out. I know just about everyone there, if not by name, then by appearance, so I could tell this guy was definitely new. He was an old man who didn't really smile much. Other than that, he seemed kind of normal. At the time, I was only a bagger and I had no training to be a cashier, which meant that I had no choice but to go outside with people if they asked for help. Most of the people I took outside were kind to me, and none of them were very weird or creepy. Until I met this guy. I helped him out, and everything seemed normal at first. He was nice, and asked me questions that I was comfortable with answering. Where I went to school, what my favorite subject was, and what grade I was in. So far, no red flags were going off. When we got to his car though, things started to get a little bit uncomfortable. Out of nowhere, he asked me if I had a boyfriend. I told him the truth, that I did. I asked him why, and he claimed that it was because his son was single and was looking for a girlfriend. I apologized, and I told him that I was happy with the relationship that I was in. I also noticed that he was staring at my chest the entire time, and I never felt more uncomfortable in my life. I looked at him, and he looked away, realizing I had caught him. I hastily finished putting his groceries away, and wished him a nice day. I took off before he could even get in his car. A few weeks later, the man came back. He made sure to come through my line so that I wouldn't have any choice but to help him outside. Every time I did, I felt this awful feeling of dread. I was scared that this guy was going to rape me in the parking lot or something like that. Every time I helped him out, he would keep asking me if I was single yet. I repeatedly told him no, I wasn't. I had a feeling that he wasn't actually asking for his son. He could have no children at all, as far as I was concerned. Our encounters became more and more uncomfortable as time went on. He would start calling me beautiful complimenting my body, telling me I had a gorgeous figure, and he still kept asking if I was single. I had a suspicion that he had somehow memorized my schedule, and I was right. He showed up on all of the days I worked. I don't know how he did it, but he knew. And needless to say, I wanted to avoid this creep as much as I could, so I changed my schedule again. He somehow memorized my new schedule, this guy was going from creepy to a legitimate stalker. I wanted to bring it up to my manager, but I doubted there would be anything that he could do. I didn't think managers had the power to ban customers from the store, so I kept my mouth shut. I soon became a cashier, and the stalking still continued. The man realized that I could no longer help him outside, so he did his best to find my register and come through my line every time. He wouldn't make as many creepy comments as he originally did, but he'd whisper to me how beautiful and gorgeous I was. He also repeatedly told me that he would date me if I was single. I felt so violated and uncomfortable that I was afraid to come to work. Thankfully, I found a way to avoid him without calling out sick. If I was bagging, and if I saw him at the checkout lane, I'd immediately run outside and go to the cart so I could avoid him. From there, I'd watch him in the parking lot until he got into his car and left. I eventually changed my schedule, so I had three days off instead of one this time, and I don't think he's managed to figure it out yet, because he's not there on every single day I work. I was having a conversation with a co-worker about creepy customers, and I mentioned the man stalking me for months. At the time, my stalker was in hearing range of our conversation, but neither I nor my co-worker knew about this. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw him give me a disgruntled and disappointed look before then leaving the register I was cashiering and going somewhere else. I cannot begin to describe how relieved I was. Since then, he showed up from time to time, but I don't see him that much. Sometimes 
If I'm helping stock the shelves with my friends from the grocery department, he'll stop me and call me beautiful and ask if I'm single now. I tell him the honest truth, which is that I'm still in a relationship. I'm not as polite about it this time. He'll walk away, giving me a glare. If he catches my gaze, he glares at me or frowns. But the thing is, I don't really care. He can be angry all he wants. The last time I saw him was a few weeks ago. I was cashiering one morning, and he just so happened to be there. He saw me and came through my line. He was polite with me, probably hoping that I'd date him or something if he was nice to me. I was wearing a cardigan with a Slytherin crest on it at the time, and I noticed him looking at it. It was probably a reason to look at my chest or something. He then asked me if it was a letter jacket and I tonelessly told him that it was just a Harry Potter jacket. I gave no sign of wanting to talk to him, and he gave me his usual frown whenever he saw me. I told him to have a nice day, and he just grunted and left the store as fast as he could. Since then, I haven't seen him. Other than the occasional drama with a co-worker, nothing uncomfortable has happened since. I doubt he's memorized my schedule, or he's gone because I haven't seen him at all. I'm wondering if my manager overheard my conversation with my co-worker and put two and two together, or he's just afraid I'll tell everyone I work with that he stalked me because if I do happen to see him, he pays no attention to me whatsoever.